Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you on this beautiful spring morning. We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad to have you. We trust Ebenezer will be a place of comfort and solace for you as you seek the Lord's face each and every Lord's day. As we're beginning our service of worship, I'm going to ask if you're seated on the aisles to uh, take that fellowship pad and give us a record of your attendance and then pass it either to the left or to the right. And I trust that if you're visiting with us, you'll leave us a name and an email address just so we can extend a warm welcome to you and our gratefulness for having you here with us. As we're anticipating our hour of worship together, I'm going to ask you to open up your worship folder and draw your attention to... Um, Two announcements in particular. One, it's obvious this morning we'll partake, be partaking of the Lord's Supper. And um, so just see there as we celebrate later in this morning a word of commendation to you that God is merciful and gracious. And then second, just uh, two beneath that, you'll see all are invited to join us tonight for an ordination service. Sam Cotton will receive ordination tonight. It'll be a Presbyterian meeting, service of worship, Scripture will be read, praise offered up, and prayer, and preaching of God's Word over us as Sam receives his ordination in the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. If you've never attended an ordination worship service, I want to encourage you to come. It's a wonderfully warm time and a very powerful time where the Spirit is present. So that's tonight here at the church. I'll ask you to come and be with us at the normal 5 p.m. worship time. In addition, I want to remind you that today is the first week as we're kicking off resumption of our Sunday school classes for the adults. We've been meeting as a singular group in the Bailey Activity Building, just finishing up a series on God's sovereignty over our lives. Now we've got three new classes beginning, all of which I think will be refreshing and encouragement to you. If you didn't receive last week's insert in the bulletin, we have them both at the front in the narthex and off to the side. And um, come join us. We have three separate classes. I think they will encourage your heart and... Um, extend you in terms of your spiritual growth. So the uh, Ebenezer Presbyterian Church and its adult Sunday school program, take note of that as well as we're moving forward. Well, just now as we're beginning, we are going to uh, press in on God and trust that his promise to us is true. He says that we should seek his face, and as we do, he will draw near to us as well. Let us remember that our hope is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth who keeps truth forever and will not forsake the work of his own hands. So let us worship God together.
Let's join together as we read the call of worship. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray together. Our Father, God of grace, God of glory, grant to us a sense of your presence even now as we begin, for you are worthy of all praise. How grateful we are for the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ even as we enter into this hour of worship. And, O oh, Father, we pray, may the work of your Spirit be resident within us, changing us, filling us, and causing us to know the joy of our Savior. In this hour and beyond, this we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together and sing The Church's One Foundation, number 277. You may be seated. We come before our holy God, mindful of who we are, sinners, saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. His willful obedience and his giving of himself on our behalf at Calvary makes us able to stand before our gracious Father. But just the same, we come in obedience to his command to confess your sins one to another. And so you see printed for you there in the bulletin the prayer of confession, 
Let's join our voice together in unison in praying this prayer. Holy God, once again we come into your presence stained by our sin. We've broken your commandments and pursued idols of our hearts instead of you. Had we been in your position, we would have long ago crushed such rebels. But you, Father, demonstrated your love in that while we were yet sinners living in rebellion, you gave your only Son to die in our place. Even more, through him you have adopted us into your royal family, making us heirs of your kingdom. We are unworthy of such mercy and humbled by such grace. As we are now in Christ by faith, see not our sin, but his righteousness credited to us, and transform us through your Spirit that we would grow in godliness each day until you make us perfect in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then this great assurance of our forgiveness by the blood of Christ alone through the Old Testament citation in Joel. Listen. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. God's grace to us.
Let's join together in prayer. Father, as we often stand beside the open grave, it seems overwhelming. We say goodbye to those we love, those we cherish. And then amidst our loss and emptiness, this great reality washes over us. The Lord Jesus has defeated death and he has risen on our behalf. Father, we thank you for this great reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus who has promised that we too shall rise as we trust in faith in him. Oh God, how could it be that you would grant to us this perfect sacrificial death in the person of your son on our behalf? You demonstrating your love for us, him dying for us even while we were yet sinners. We look upon his perfect life, fulfilling the covenant of works, and we rejoice knowing that we could never do that. Even the thoughts of our minds from time to time are tinged with arrogance and pride and lust. We see the perfection of all that he does lived out on our behalf. We are amazed, O God, that we receive his merit his perfect ledger sheet applied to our account such that in our dying you only know that we have had a perfect life and him fulfilling the covenant of grace on our behalf in such a way that he gives himself for us graciously covering all of our sins And granting to us in this great exchange, beyond our reasoning, his perfection for our imperfection. His beauty for our awfulness. His grace for our sin. Oh God, we have read by way of the writings of man that which has outlined to be true in the scriptures that on our death, our soul goes immediately to be with God in all holiness and our bodies lie in the grave, still in union with Christ. And then that day when the Lord returns, when the bodies resting with him in the grave will rise up and be reunited with those souls now made perfect and we like him will rise again. We thank you for this incredible promise that every Christian has and with which we now rest. What a great promise for the future, Father, and even we thank you now for the reality of your blessing that you have brought to us in this week. That you have satisfied our mouth with good things. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We place our confidence in you and We rejoice for that which you have given to body and soul. We thank you for family. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for the comforts, these creature comforts that we enjoy day in and day out. Let us never take them for granted. Father, we thank you for this nation. We thank you for all that we have, evidence of your common grace to those who will not even name Christ as king. What a good and loving and faithful God that you are. We pray, Father, even in the midst of our blessing, for those who have known hardship and struggle this week, for those who are without employment, we ask, will God grant to them a sufficiency? For those, Father, who have sickness or trial, we ask that you would heal and sustain them. We pray especially for Marty Cope, even as he's home from the hospital now, but we pray that you would grant to him all strength and ability. We pray, Father, soon he would be back with us. We ask that you would Be gracious to Fran as his caregiver and to the whole of his family. Thank you for their life in this body. We pray for others, Father, who uh, are on the end of surgeries. And we pray, O Father, that you would continue uh, your strength and blessing in the life of Carolyn Mobley, Ed's wife. And even as she's in 
recovery now. Grant to her in rehabilitation a full measure of health that she might return home soon and sustain and strengthen Ed as well as he waits. Father, we would not forget the mark of the gospel upon us and we are hungry, we are desperate for you even this morning. And so as we anticipate the preaching of the word over us, grant, O oh God, that it would be effectual in our lives. Not just a Bible lesson, not just a verse from the scriptures, not just three points and a poem, but Father, we pray the very word of God to us. That this would be, even as we listen, food and drink, that eating the body of Christ as it's preached over us and drinking the blood of Christ, even as we understand it more fully from the holy text, we would have a sense that Jesus is my savior. He's saving me. Oh God, we, we look to you. Grant that you would be our father. We've confessed our sins already. We're trusting in the shed blood of your son, but minister grace to us, we pray, in a fresh and a new way unlike anything we have known even to today. Thank you for this people who are your own. Your blessing, we pray, would rest upon them and their families. Grant us a boldness for the gospel, even as we go in the telling of it to those around us. Father, let us never be ashamed for that great message, which alone is able to save the soul and the body. And even now, Father, we look to you to come and pour out that which we could never grant to ourselves. Let the Lord Jesus be lifted up and may he fulfill that promise to us that by that lifting all men, all women will be drawn to him. This is our prayer in the name of Christ our King who saves us. Amen. I don't believe we have ushers this morning taking up our offering today uh, so we will use the uh, boxes on uh, the sides uh, entrances or exits as you're leaving uh, worship this morning please turn in your bibles to our scripture reading today it is from the gospel of mark chapter 3 beginning in verse 31 we're actually going to look at verses 20 and 21 read those rather and then We'll move into 31 through 35. We are continuing this morning in our series uh, through this gospel that Mark wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let me lead us first in prayer. Our Father, we join the psalmist David in declaring, With you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. We beseech you now, by your Spirit, bring your light to bear upon us in the reading and in the preaching of your holy word. Use it to awaken the careless, to disturb the comfortable, bring comfort to the afflicted, rebuke those clinging to sin, give hope to the hopeless, and call all people to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that none are without excuse. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand with me out of deference to the Lord God Almighty, the reading of his word, the text for our sermon today. From Mark chapter 3, beginning first in verse 20. Then he, that is Jesus, went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Then verse 31, and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. You may be seated. I 
I have never lived anywhere but in the southeastern part of the United States, and so I'm not sure how it is in other parts of the country, but in the South, family connections are still very important to many people. That's certainly been my experience living in both Georgia and in South Carolina for a number of years. One of the more challenging aspects of coming to Ebenezer was learning of all the different family relationships that exist in the church. I still remember someone telling me early on, be careful what you say about someone, you just might be talking to one of their kin. Extended families often live nearby each other. They get together routinely. If land is owned, I found this especially true in Georgia, it's typically passed down from generation to generation. But as important as families are today, they were even more important in Jesus' time. In first century Israel, extended families often lived in the same communities for generations. If a son or a daughter got married, it was common that they would live at least for a period of time, in the home of the young man's parents. If there was a family business like farming, the children actively participated in it. And it was usually the case that a son would learn from his father the trade that he did, and perhaps at a later point would join his father in it. Since there was no health care system, adult children cared for their elderly parents, And since there was no welfare system, families looked out after widows and orphans. Being a part of a family represented security and safety and protection. Now keep that in mind as we look at our text this morning. Verses 31 through 35, as I did in our scripture reading, should be read in conjunction with verses 20 and 21. There you'll remember Jesus and his disciples had returned to their home base in Capernaum. The crowd that now followed Jesus had become so large and difficult to to manage that the disciples of Jesus found it difficult even to have a meal together without being interrupted. And with his popularity spreading throughout the region, his family in Nazareth had become concerned about his well-being. For reasons that I outlined last week, they were convinced that he was not in his right mind. And so his mother and his half-brothers made the trip somewhere around 60 miles from Nazareth to Capernaum in order to take hold of him, to seize him, and to bring him back home. You might think of it as a first century intervention. You'll notice no mention here is made of Joseph. So it's widely accepted that at this point he most likely had died. Now in the meantime, we saw last week the confrontation between Jesus and the scribes that had come from Jerusalem. And as we pick back up in verse 31, Mark writes, And his father and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. Did you hear that? Where was Jesus' family? They're standing outside. Already, Mark is preparing us for Jesus' words by distinguishing between those who are on the outside and those who are within. So Jesus is given the message that his mother and his brothers are outside looking for him. And everyone there would have expected the same thing. They would have expected that Jesus would have dutifully gotten up and he would have gone to his family, but he didn't. Instead, he responded by asking, who are my mother and my brothers? His question was meant to challenge assumptions and to provoke thoughtful evaluation. And then looking around at those who were seated with him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. You know, during his ministry, Jesus said many things that shocked those who heard him. He called the highly respected Pharisees whitewashed tombs. He declared that a tax collector was more righteous than a Pharisee. 
he praised a small offering of a couple pennies that was given by a poor widow. He told a parable in which a despised Samaritan was made the hero of it. And he described a heavenly banquet in which the Gentiles were enjoying the party while the Jews were on the outside looking in. And all of these things no doubt left his hearers stunned, but none more so than this. Family was everything in the Jewish culture. And here was Jesus redefining family in a way that I'm sure stung those who were closest to him. Now, what do we make of Jesus' statement? Well, first, we need to understand what Jesus was not doing here. Jesus was not dismissing the value of family in his own culture or in ours today. After all, as John tells us in the prologue to his gospel, Jesus is the eternal word through whom all things were made, and thus he is the creator of the first family. When he made Adam and Eve, when he instituted the covenant of marriage between them as husband and wife, and he gave them children... As Jesus was faithful in keeping the whole law, he obeyed the fifth commandment by honoring his mother and his father. You'll remember as he hung on the cross, his concern for his mother led him to entrust Mary to his disciple John. Likewise, in Luke 7.11, he criticized the Pharisees for failing to honor their parents in times of need, by taking money that should have been used to help, his, help their elderly parents, and instead they were declaring it to be Corban, that is, devoted or given to God. Through his spirit, Christ inspired the Apostle Paul to write about family relationships in both his letter to the Ephesians and the Colossians. And in 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul writes that Christians who do not provide for their own family members in times of need are worse than an unbeliever. They are worse than an unbeliever in the sense that they know better and yet they fail to obey. So friends, let it be established that Jesus was not dismissing the value of family. He held family in a very high regard. What then was he doing? Well, he was using this occasion to teach a spiritual lesson. He was teaching his hearers then and us today that there is a kind of family with an even deeper bond than flesh and blood, and that is the family of God. And so let's look at this by focusing on three points here. The first is entrance into God's family. The second is the priority of God's family. And third is the identifying mark of God's family. So first, how does one enter God's family? Well, that's a question that has been answered differently by different people. For instance, in the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s, liberal theology, that is a kind of theology that originated really in Europe and in Germany and worked its way over to the states and unfortunately into the seminaries where ministers were trained in it. Liberal theology emphasized what was known as uh, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. It was a flawed and unbiblical theology that broke down distinctions among the various world religions by de-emphasizing the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and the atoning work of the cross is the perfect sacrifice for atonement and for sins rather and it replaced it with a kind of religious pluralism that is still evident among those today who suggest that there are multiple ways and paths to God and ultimately everyone is saved not surprisingly this theology greatly diminished any priority that had been given to evangelism and world missions after all why be concerned with missions if everyone is already a child of god 
not a very limited sense, we might say that God is the father of all and that he is the creator of all people and all people owe their existence to him. In Acts 17, 28, when Paul was preaching in Athens, he quoted one of their poets and said, for we are indeed his offspring. But that is not at all what Jesus was talking about here. Entrance into God's family does not come about by a physical birth, but by a spiritual rebirth, being born again, born from above. You remember in John chapter 3, in the account of Nicodemus, the Pharisee, coming to see Jesus at night, and Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born again, and Nicodemus was confused by this. Thinking only in physical terms, he said to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Amazingly, this man was a teacher of Israel, and yet he was clueless. Jesus told him that this new birth is not physical in nature, but it is spiritual. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. When all of us were born, spiritually speaking, we entered this world with a heart of stone, a hard heart, and we inherited that we inherited from our first father, Adam, a heart that was hard to God and dead to his will. Romans 8, 7, Paul calls this being in the flesh. And he writes, for the mind that is set on the flesh it's hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And in this condition, Paul goes on to note in Ephesians 2, 3, that far from being children of God, we are actually children of wrath. And nothing can change our condition on our side. It's not a matter if we had better education or if we had more money or if we had more programs to assist in this, no, that will not fix it. But friends, while you and I are helpless to alter our condition, God is not. In Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, I've read this passage before, God declared, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh that is a heart that is a soft heart, a pliable heart, a heart that is open to God and I will put my spirit within you. This is an Old Testament picture of being born again, spiritual rebirth, regeneration. And only those who have received this rebirth are made able and willing to look to Christ in faith as their Savior and Lord. John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, that is, received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. So how do we become a part of God's family? It happens only by spiritual rebirth, which brings forth faith. And now as the Holy Spirit indwells us, we are able to call upon God as our Father. Romans 8.15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we call out, Abba, Father. 2 Peter 1, 4 even tells us that those who are born again of the Spirit become partakers of the divine nature. That doesn't mean that we become little gods, but rather we begin to look more and more like our Father in terms of godliness. You might say we begin to bear our Father's resemblance. Peter is describing sanctification. In addition, Hebrews 2.11 says that Christ becomes our elder brother. And now by virtue of our relationship to Christ, we become brothers and sisters with one another in God's family. And friends, 
the implications for this are incredible, not just for eternity, but don't miss the implications that this has for us right now, especially in terms of how we relate to one another in this household of faith. Remember, we in the church are called to make visible God's invisible kingdom. We in the church are called to give a credible and a compelling witness to the watching world around us. The depth of our fellowship in here, the depth of our fellowship should be such that unbelievers look upon us and they find themselves longing to be a part of us. They should be able to say as they look upon us, there is something different about those Christians. There is something distinctly different about the way those who profess faith in Christ and call upon his name. Something different in the way that they love one another, forgive one another, handle disagreements, speak the truth in love, practice forbearance, and demonstrate kindness within the household of God, the church. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, Paul told Timothy, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Treat younger men like brothers, older women like mothers, younger women like sisters, in all purity. Do we do that? Do we do that? It's one way that we demonstrate our new birth in the Spirit. It's part of being in the family of God. Second, we see in Jesus' words the priority of God's family. The priority of God's family. In Luke chapter 2, we have recorded for us an event that took place during Jesus' adolescent years. He had gone with his family to Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover, and afterwards they were headed back to their home in Nazareth, no doubt traveling in a large caravan, large uh, group of others from Nazareth, uh, made up of extended family and friends. Mary and Joseph assumed that Jesus was with someone else in the group, but eventually they realized he was not. Panic-stricken, they went rushing back to Jerusalem, and three days later, they finally were able to find him. He was in the temple, and he was sitting among the teachers and the scholars, and he was engaged in theological discussions, just what you would expect of your normal 12-year-old at that time. Mary could not hide her frustrations, and she said to Jesus, Why have you treated us so? And do you remember what Jesus said? Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? Right then, if they didn't know it before, right then, Joseph and Mary knew that their son lived by a different set of priorities and so do God's people today. And according to those priorities, sometimes our allegiance to God, our Father, and His family will put us into conflict with our earthly families. In Matthew 10, 37, Jesus said, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Friends, these are the most personal relationships that we have. And yet Jesus says, no, your relationship with me must come before all others. We've all heard accounts of those who were raised in other religions like Islam and God redeemed them by his grace, but as a result, their family will no longer have anything to do with them. Mothers and fathers say to them, you are dead to us. How incredibly painful that must be. But when cast out by others, it is our Lord who welcomes us to himself. 
Psalm 27 verse 10 says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. As Jesus told Peter in Matthew 19, 29, everyone who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or land for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life no matter the cost of our discipleship and what is given up in this life there is not a single one of us who will stand before God on that day and not say it was more than worth it friends as I pointed out before faithfulness to God means honoring our families but even our families can become idols if we allow them to supplant Christ as the chief loyalty of our lives. Our allegiance must be to him and his will first. And third, we find here the identifying mark of those in God's family, the identifying mark. Now certainly the identifying physical mark upon those in God's family is the sign and seal of baptism the covenant sign and seal of god's promises like circumcision that is bestowed upon not only believers but upon their children as well they are part of god's covenant family as well but here in verse 35 jesus speaks of another mark he said for whoever does the will of god he is my brother and sister and mother so how do you know? How do I know if we are a part of God's family? Jesus says it is by doing God's will, what he commands. And this is not works righteousness, trying to earn our salvation. Remember, we are not talking about the cause of salvation. We're talking about the identifying mark that confirms one's salvation. And that is obedience obedience to God's will isn't that true of God's only begotten son in John 7 34 Jesus said my food the very sustenance of my physical body my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work and Jesus said to his followers in John 14 15 if you love me you will keep my commandments. Friends, the commands of the Lord are not burdensome to those who love him because in our new birth, the Spirit gives us both the desire as well as the ability to walk in obedience, to walk in holiness. Remember Ezekiel 34 that I just read. God said, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's being born again. And I will put my spirit within you. And here's the result. Cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That is doing my will. And so the confirmation that you and I have been truly born again, that we truly are a part of God's family, is an outward obedience to God's will that is motivated by an inward love for God and a desire to glorify Him. Does that describe you? Can you say with the psalmist, Oh, how I love your law, O oh God. Because through it, God shows you the kind of life that is pleasing to him. Do you desire to do God's will, not merely as a duty, but as a delight by which you bring him glory? If so, then praise God. Because those things are the result of the new birth that he has given to you through his Holy Spirit. And give thanks that Christ has received you and welcomed you into his family of faith. But maybe you're here this morning and you honestly do not see in your life a deep desire to do God's will. You do not 
love God's law. You do not eagerly study the scriptures or pray in order to better understand his commands and direction for your life. You are not interested in pursuing God's will. You're only interested in your will, your way. And you're okay with God as long as he stays in his place and doesn't interfere or require anything of you than occasions of coming into the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. If that is the case, then in light of what Jesus has said in our scripture reading, are you really a part of his family? I'm not asking, is your name on the membership role of a church? There are lots of church members who will perish. No, I'm asking you, do you delight in God and doing his will? Have you been born again? Are you really saved? One person said, God has no grandchildren, only children. No one enters his family simply by their physical birth, but only by their spiritual rebirth. I pray then that God's spirit would breathe new life into your soul and begin to stir within your heart a love and faith in his son. I pray that you would find in yourself a flourishing desire to do God's will and to live for his glory. And when God has done this, I pray that you will rejoice that he has brought you into his family in which he is your father. Christ Jesus is your elder brother. And all of those around you are your brothers and sisters through faith in him. Let's pray together. Our great God and Father, we rejoice that you should choose to welcome into your family those as unworthy as we are. Truly, you have taken us from being children of wrath and you have made us children of the King and heirs of your kingdom, co-heirs with Christ Jesus, our elder brother. And we pray for those who have yet to know the new life you alone give through your Holy Spirit. O Lord, replace their hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. Come and dwell within them by your Spirit. And bring their every thought and every desire and every affection into agreement with your will. They would confirm they are children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to come to this table and to celebrate this family meal of the Lord's Supper, which he has prepared for us, let's join together and sing from the Psalter, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 9. God, be merciful to me. You may remain seated. The words are in your bulletin.
We come as a family before a family table to enjoy a family meal. God has been merciful to us by the blood of the Lord Jesus shed on our behalf. And so now we anticipate eating this bread emblematic of his body given for us and drinking this cup emblematic of his blood shed on our behalf. As we draw near to the Lord's Supper to celebrate the Holy Communion of the body and blood of Christ, we gratefully remember that our Lord instituted this sacrament to be observed in his church until the end of the world. It is a perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice that he himself has made by his death on behalf of those who are his brothers and his sisters. It is for their spiritual nourishment and for their growth in him and that they might be engaged in all the duties that they owe to him and by a bond of pledge grant themselves a union with him and with his mystical body. Let us consider earnestly our great need of having our comfort and our strength renewed in this earthly pilgrimage and our warfare. It's necessary that we come to the Lord's table in this way, with knowledge, what it is he has done on our behalf, with faith that we are not enough in ourselves, with repentance of that which we have done and for which it grieves us, with love towards those who are members of our own family and beyond, and with hearts hungering and thirsting after Christ. We must not willingly embrace transgression and offense. We must not willingly hold fellowship with hatred or impurity. We must not willingly cherish pride and self-righteousness in our hearts. And we must not willingly trust secretly in our own good works and merits, for we have none. We have only that which Christ has done on our behalf, the giving of his body and the shedding of his blood for us. Those who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from the burden of those sins, those who place their trust in Christ, those who desire his grace to lead a holy life, it is these that are invited and encouraged in his name to come and partake of this holy meal amongst this family. Let us therefore come so that we might find refreshing and rest for our souls. Beloved in the Lord, listen to these words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they were delivered by the Apostle Paul. He writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner... Also he took the cup, and when he had supped, he said this, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, and as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do now show the Lord's death until he comes. And now, in his name, I take these elements to be set apart by prayer and thanksgiving for this holy use to which he has appointed them. Let's pray together. O God, our Father, by the blood of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus, who has consecrated for us a new and living way into the holiest of all, cleanse our minds, we pray, by the inspiration of your Spirit, and drawing near unto you with a pure heart and an undefiled conscience, our prayer is that we might receive these gifts without sin and that we might worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are a family, and as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do so as a symbol of our unity, one with another, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as the elders will be coming forward to receive the elements, and as they distribute them to you, I'll ask you to hang on to that bread and to hang on to that cup. And as all have been served, then together we'll partake, indicative that we belong to one another and we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ as well.
When you have the tray coming before you, you'll notice that there will be at the center a number of cups which are sealed. They contain both bread and the juice, and a number of cups which have juice on the top, bread on the bottom. They're stuck, stacked one on top of the other. You simply remove the top cup which has the juice, place it in the holder, and the bread beneath it. So you're free to uh, partake of whichever you like. While well, this is a family meal, a common meal to those who have faith in Christ, it is not a simple meal. It's emblematic of Christ's spiritual presence with us even now. And it is a sacred meal. It has eternal value. It's the reason the Holy Scriptures outline that any who eat in an unworthy manner eat this meal with judgment upon their heads. But to those who know Christ, to those who have faith, not in themselves, but in the Lord Jesus himself, it is the best of all family meals. In the eating, our faith is strengthened, as it said, by way of the book of worship, for the welfare and for the warfare that awaits us. 
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me and eats will never hunger. Eat in faith. As Jesus gathered around that table that night with 12 men, he knew that one would betray him, one was unfaithful. And even while Judas' hand was in the dish with the Lord, he recognized, I am not one of this family. And he departed without taking the cup of forgiveness. Jesus says that this cup is the new covenant in my blood emblematic of the forgiveness of sins by the shedding of his blood. The scriptures record that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so by Christ giving of himself and allowing that sacred flow, we enjoy forgiveness now and forevermore. Drink in faith. Let's pray together. Our good and glorious God, we rejoice this day in the eating of this meal as a family, knowing that as a father in compassion you have provided for your children by the giving of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus, and for that we rejoice. We're mindful of his great perfection and our great unworthiness. And in the eating of this bread and the drinking of this cup, we do proclaim his death for us. And in faith, we trust in him, in his merit and his goodness. And so, Father, even now as we gain strength, even from these physical elements, we pray that we would gain a new spiritual strength, that our faith would be renewed, that our union with Christ would be remembered in a more vibrant and life-giving way. And through all of this, we pray, O oh God, we would serve you with a truer, stronger heart. Thank you again for that which only you could provide through our great good. And this we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'm asking you to turn to hymn number 286. We'll be standing together to sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Thank you for being in worship this morning. I do want to encourage you to come back tonight for the uh, ordination service for Sam Cotton, uh, which will be at 5 o'clock this evening. And I uh, also want to encourage you to come to Sunday school now, since we've broken back up into our other our uh, classes. We have two of them that will be over in Bailey, and then we have the class uh, that will be over First and Second Timothy in the Academy building. So we'd love to have you join us for any of those. Hear now God's good benediction from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.